Ben Berkey, you, know, you look like a cowboy with that vest. I mean, that, uh, that thing over your nose. Know, that's exactly what they had to do. And uh, uh, so anyway, I thought that was a good picture. Uh, some of the terms that they used for the cattle were Mustangs, Mustanos, uh, Oyanos, that meant earmarked. A lot of times you just cut a chunk out of their ear, a B or a W or whatever you put in there, and that's your cow. And um, Castilian, or some big button, Texas cattle, Riojo, Iberian, and uh, these are the men who are called the uh, Caros or Conquistadores. So um, that's just, uh, there's so many varieties of horns, uh, and they've all got names. And the cut of a, a beef is the same as anything. Uh, that was a guy named Adams that wrote back in, uh, around the turn of the 19th century, uh, around, uh, he would go out and find all of these old guys that went up, they call it going up the trail, that was a cattle drive, and he would find them and interview them, and uh, Mr. Adams wrote books that were true stories that he got from these real cattle drives, and they're very interesting stories because they're true, and it tells about the hardships. And uh, this is an old West Texas, I don't know this guy's name, but he's it, an old West Texas rancher. He loved longhorns. And that was probably one of his cows that died. And uh, Ms. Speakerman, I know you've raised longhorns, and they're, they're unique cows. We've got cows that they're going to die on our place. Uh, they just mean a lot to us, you know, they're like family members. And I'm sure that's, uh, he's reminiscing there of an old cow that, that he had. Um, before I talk to you about the longhorn cattle live longer than other cows. Uh, we've got a, a four or five people that are elderly, uh, you know, 90s, and they still raise cattle up around our area, which is northwest of Betty in the Bethlehem community. Uh, about five miles, and uh, so they have longhorn cattle, cows, and they put a black Angus bull with them, and because longhorn calves, if you take them to a regular auction, they don't, they don't give you much money for them, because they don't want them in a feedlot. Uh, they grow a little bit slower, and they got horns. They want what's called a black baldy. It's got a half Hereford, half Angus, maybe a touch of Brahmin in it. <coughs> so uh, these people, they have the low maintenance cows. They don't catch disease very easy. They hardly ever die. And their calves look more like a black Angus. So when they load them up and take them to sale, they get top prices on them. But they don't have all that work and expense of keeping up a black Angus cow. You know, so uh, that's a kind of a uh, this is Charlie Schreiner, Kerrville, orphan, about 10 years old, I think maybe from the war or something. Bought a couple of sheep, worked for them, raised them. Lived on his own out in the wilderness, sold him, made profit, did again, did again, did again, and he ended up uh, being rich because he got enough to where he could buy some steers, and he and a couple of friends drove them up to Kansas. Now, they would either catch the cattle and drive them up, or they would buy them from these Vaquero ranchers, and they'd pay them about four or five dollars a piece. But they were getting twenty to thirty dollars a piece for them in Kansas, and they sold by the head. They didn't sell by the pound. So um, it was a huge profit, huge profit. So during this twenty years, there's over two hundred million dollars worth of 
of Longhorn cattle sold in Kansas. And all of that money was brought right back into Texas. And they were called Texas Gold. That's the nickname they gave them. And so they were brought back into Texas, which fueled railroads and industries, also created a bigger ranching industry. And uh, people like, there's a Shriner University in Kerrville, where it's a pretty small but a very elite uh, university. And uh, he came back and he put in a bank. He first put in a little store, and then he turned it into a bank, and he would hide people's money in, under a board in the back. <laughs> and, but he was a smart man and tough, and he had been through the worst of all time. Ended up, he, then he got a safe and he started a real bank. And then his sons, he was the, like, the first one to bring electricity into a West Texas town. So, a very, very famous man. Um, I'm on Facebook, friends, with one of his uh, sons, Charlie Schreiner Ford. That's his name. And uh, pretty sharp guy. Uh, this is a guy that had a ranch at uh, Milby down around Houston area. Uh, this is Yates. Uh, it is his last name. I found this picture. Uh, um, I'm trying to think. His son is Cap Yates out around Alpine. Still raises long ones. And Ira. This is Ira. Okay. Has anybody ever been through the town I ran in West Texas? Anybody know where it's at? Um, Cynthia does, I know. Uh, and uh, there's, it's a town called I ran. And so he started out real poor, rounded up his own cattle, drove them up to Kansas, sold them, come back, invested in land, everything, kept more cows, drove them up, started making lots of money, hiring bigger herd. Uh, Cowboys groups and driving bigger herds. But he didn't have a town. He was married to a lady named Ann. So he started a town and he called it Ira Ann. And <laughs> <laughs> pretty smart, wasn't it? And uh, if you don't have a town, just make you one. You know, he's got the money now. But he bought up so much land. You know, it's like 50 cents an acre at the most. And he bought thousands and thousands and thousands of acres. Well, in the 30s, I think it was, or 20s, they discovered oil on it. You know? So uh, the guy became extremely wealthy. And he had uh, five or six sons. Cap Yates is still alive, and he's in the Alpine area. Now, you've got to understand, too, that they brought in all of these, we'll call them British cattle, Herefords, Angus of Scotland and everything, plus your Indian cattle, the Brahmin, but Indian cattle can't live in cold weather. So they brought those down around the coast, Galveston and everything, and, and there were big ranches down there. Uh, I read where one guy brought in, it was thousands of these Brahmin bulls. And um, they thought, well, man, we breed them in with those longhorns and we'll have tough cattle because the longhorns didn't die from tick disease and things like that. And so, uh, but the problem that they had was when you've got a, a Hereford or an Angus bull and you bring it into a group of longhorns and you got bulls in there that are bigger with bigger horns, <laughs> that little Herford Bull didn't last very long. He got killed. So, uh, you know, uh, it took a while to get that going. But they did that because beef started selling by the pound because they got railroads into Fort Worth. And it changed everything at that time. So, uh, these are, I won't go into. Now, this is a very important person. He is. Uh, J. Frank Doby, I named a bull calf that one time, and he sold for a lot of money. But uh, J. Frank Doby fought in World War I. He taught English at the University of Texas for years, 
and he was born in southwest Texas on a Longhorn ranch. And he just thought that's the most beautiful place in the world. And, you know, if you've ever been there, there's nothing but cactus. And it either bites you or sticks you. One or two. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, uh, at this picture, he is principal of Alpine High School in 1923. Now, my mother-in-law, Katie Williams, she graduated high school from Alpine. Uh, way after that, maybe. Uh, but anyway, he was very famous and very, and I'll tell you, he was teaching at University of Texas. He was making 990 something dollars a year. Okay, so his uncle, who's kind of a entrepreneur, investor, everything, he bought the thousands and thousands of acres down in southwest Texas. And he bought a bunch of cattle, borrowed money to do it, and he started a ranch. And he came to J. Frank Dobie and he said, uh, okay, I'll double your salary if you'll come and be foreman on my ranch. Well, J. Frank Dobie loved ranching, and he loved Longhorns. So he quit the University of Texas, and he spent about nine years running that ranch. And then uh, there was a drought and they lost a lot of money and so he went back to the University of Texas to start teaching. So uh, this is a, a picture of him and you notice he's got the chaps, he's got the boots. And, and you know, we didn't mention the boots a while ago, but uh, uh, I'm wearing a pair from M.L. Letty in Fort Worth at the stockyards there. Yep. And so they're pointed. It's, it's called a what's it called now? A clip toe, a clip toe, I think. It's, it's pointed. And if you're gonna jump on a horse really fast to get out of the way of a mad cow, you better make sure that foot's going in that stirrup. So you want some pointed boots, you know. And uh, or you throwing your leg over. You don't want to try to adjust anything. You don't want it to go in there. So. Pointed boots were part of their uh, dress, and the boots come up high because of the rattlesnakes. <laughs> They're everywhere in West Texas. And of course, the spurs, there's 